Well, we have two more messages in our series, Journey Detours, The Life of Joseph. And uh, I've already, our next sermon series is going to be on uh, the book of James, for any of you that were wondering. And so uh, today and tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week, uh, we'll be the, our finishing up our Journey Detours, Life of Joseph, and then we'll move into James. Uh, I believe that is August 15th. I believe that's the date. But let's do a, a quick recap again. I'm sure everyone is still familiar, but I want to end up end off where we left off. And so uh, Joseph, uh, God gave him dreams and told him that he'd be, uh, you know, bowed down to, that people, was, his brothers would worship, or would bow down and honor him, and, and they got angry, frustrated with him, uh, they threw him in a well, and then they said, that's not enough, and so let's sell him into slavery, sold him to slavery, went to Egypt, and he was in prison for 13 years, uh, slavery in prison for about 13 years total, and when he was age 30, Um, God finally fulfilled his promise in Joseph's life, and Joseph became second in command because he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and uh, had a plan, had an economic plan, and he put him in charge. And uh, Joseph, second in command of all of Egypt, and all of a sudden, uh, because this famine came all over the land that God had told Pharaoh through a dream and Joseph interpreted, that Joseph then has this encounter with his brothers because Jacob... Uh, all of the, the father of all of these brothers and Joseph, they're dying because of the famine. All their families are all dying because of this massive famine that's taking over all of like the Middle East area. And so they send, uh, they send all ten brothers, not Benjamin or Joseph, of course, send them to Egypt because they find that Egypt has food. And so as they get to Egypt, Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers don't recognize him because they all think he's dead. Okay. And so when he recognizes them, he kind of thinks of a plan. He's kind of working his head, man, I really want to punish them. I really want to make them squirm. They deserve this. And, and he's kind of going through. You can see the way he talks to them. He's wrestling with them, but he's not nice to them whatsoever. And so he kind of comes up with this idea. He calls them spies, and he says that if you, are, you guys are spies, and you're just trying to steal our food, and you're trying to see, take over because we have all the food, and you're trying to do this. And they're like, no, we're just a family. We're starving to death, and, and uh, we just need food to live. We want to buy this food. And so Joseph says, puts them in prison for three days, and then once they're all nice and, and soft, ready to, ready to really get the kick, Joseph decides that I'm going to put one brother, Simeon, in prison. So he puts Simeon in prison, and he says, Go back home, bring back your brother Benjamin. If you do that, I'll know you're not a spy. And so he gives him the food, and then Joseph actually puts, uh, one of his workers, puts the money back in the bags of food that they were used to buy the food. And so as they're going back, they find this money, and they're all freaking out because they think, oh, they think I stole. They're going to think we stole. We're going to be killed Simeon, our brother who's in prison, is definitely going to be killed because if we go back and we show our face again, they're going to say that we stole and we're all going to be imprisoned. So they go back to their father. In last week's message, we talked about how Jacob uh, had no faith because everything was out of control. And he goes, woe is me. I, oh, man, my, I'm going to die. I'm an old man. I'm going to die from this. And my son, Joseph, is dead. And, and Simeon's in prison. And, and, and all of this pressure and weight it's just, you're, they want my son Ben, my, my, my beloved Benjamin now. There's no way I'm going to give him up. And we see his lack of faith and his lack of control. And so um, they talk their father into letting them take Benjamin back to, uh, to Egypt. And a uh, really cool thing in this story is Judah actually, and multiple brothers, kind of step up to say, hey, I will vouch for him. If I, if I don't come back with him, you can kill my kids. You can take my kids. You can, you can take my life if I, don't, if I don't return with your beloved Benjamin. But we have to do this. And the reason why they had this sense of urgency is because they'd already gone through all the food already. So some time has gone by that all of their families had gone through all this food. And, and these sons were having a sense of urgency because their families were dying. If they didn't go back and get more food, they would all be dead. And so they're like twisting Jacob's arm. Hey, I know you don't want to lose Benjamin, and I can vouch for him, but we're all going to lose all of our family if you don't sacrifice one of your sons. 
If you don't let us and trust us to take Benjamin, we're all going to die. And so I, 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 I love this series because I feel like this series brought us deeper into this discussion of our character and our motivations, especially when we think about last week's message about not having control during times where things are mass chaos in our lives. Those are the times that our faith, it's measured. Do we really trust and obey God? Or is our faith really just a facade or something that we say that we have when really we don't have faith at all? We just call our religion faith. And we don't really have true faith in our life. Real faith in God. With this new CDC guidelines that came out, I was, uh, that just came out what, yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, or, or the other day, and I was hearing about it, and, and you're seeing the St. Louis news and all the mass stuff and everything, I'm like, I was just like, no, not again, not this again. And I just was overwhelmed, and I remember I just sat there, and I'm like, I just want all of this COVID garbage to be done. Like, I just want to be done. And how many of you are in that same place where you just, you're thinking, man, can we just get back to life? And just like, I wish it, not that's not there. I'm not saying it's not there. But like, wish that it would just be wiped away magically. Or, or God would just wipe it off and it's gone. And we can go back to living, living life and just worrying about the flu and cancer and all the other stuff that kill us. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't. But anyway, like, I, I just wish that. And I, as I was thinking that, I was sitting there watching, watching uh, my girls, and um, a, I saw a Facebook post that somebody posted, and I think it was a t-shirt that they were selling, uh, this person was advertising, and it said, normal is not coming back, Jesus is. And I was like, man, that kicked me square in the mouth, like, Wow. I'm begging for normal, normal to come back. Because I, you know, I want to go on vacations without having to put on a mask. I want to do all this stuff. I want, to, I want to be able to live. I don't want to have to think about what we have to do with the church or our events and all this different stuff. And I want normal to come back. And, and this person just put me in my place. Normal's not coming back. Jesus is. And that is the mind of someone who knows God's word and has true faith. Today we come to one of the most powerful pictures of God's love and Jesus' character that we could ever glance upon. And I know we're talking about Joseph this morning, but at this moment, Joseph perfectly illustrates who Jesus is and who God desires us to be. So we're going to look at this story of Joseph and we're going to see a perfect illustration of who Jesus is and what he's going to, who he is for each one of us and who God wants us to be as he calls us to be like Jesus. So Joseph and his brothers are on the way back to Egypt on their second journey, and Benjamin, the blood brother of Joseph, is coming with him. Okay. Now, now remember, the reason why Benjamin is so beloved by Jacob is because he is the son of Rachel, who is the same mother as Joseph. She had two sons. This was the, the wife that Jacob loved. Okay, that he truly loved. So these two kids meant the world to, to Jacob. As his wife died in child, like, uh, shortly after childbirth. Um, and so uh, he loves these two boys. And so he sends these boys so that he could save all of his family. And um, Joseph, who had, again, gone from living uh, in slavery, was in prison, thrown into a pit, and now second in command, and leading Egypt through one of the greatest droughts ever faced. And Joseph had remembered, had, had seen his brothers and de, uh, devised this plan, but his brothers had no idea that this was Joseph. I want to just make sure everyone understands that, that his brothers have no idea that Joseph is the one that's doing all these things to them, that are pulling all these cards and making them go through all these hoops. Let's take a look in uh, Genesis chapter 43, verse 15. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. That's where I'm going to be spending most of my time in chapter 43. It says, The men took the gifts and, the, and double the amount of silver, and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. I wonder what the brothers talked about on their journey, second journey to Egypt. 
What did they talk about? Were they, were they filled with fear? Were they scared that as they go back, as they bring a double amount of money, they're bringing that double amount hoping that when they get there, they're not going to be immediately thrown in prison because they're going to be uh, convicted of stealing. So they bring double the amount to pay for both and, and to plead with, plead with jo- or the, the second in command of Egypt that they didn't steal this stuff. So they have this fear in their hearts, fear for their families, fear for their father who's, who's an old man and he's so scared of dying and losing people. Uh, what are they filled with? And a real interesting point that maybe I might be making this up, or you know, commentators believe the same thing, but it's really interesting that the brothers on their way to Egypt probably had to walk past the well that they threw Joseph into. Because Joseph was sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites who went to Egypt, so it's probably along that way, and usually those wells and those pits are on roads nearby, and that's the way they traveled, so people could stop and get water and things like that. And so... On that way, on the way to Egypt, do you think the brothers stopped and looked at that well that they had thrown their brother in? I think they had guilt and shame in their hearts for what they had done as they walked past that spot and saw, oh man, just thinking they're walking in a line or, or, or they're riding their donkeys or camels or horses or whatever, and they're walking through this path. And as they see this well, I wonder if that started stirring something in their heart. And maybe one brother started to cry, and maybe one brother started to curse at himself. And, and what, what was in their heart as they passed that spot where they tossed their little brother into a well like he was a piece of dirt? Were they worried? What did they feel? Did they say anything when they passed by that pit? Benjamin was with them for the first time, and if you don't know this, Benjamin didn't have any idea what had happened. It's not like they came back and told Ben, the brother who was uh, too young at this time, hey, by the way, we threw your brother into a pit and we sold him into slavery. So Ben's going on this trip not knowing anything, just knows his brother died. And he's going on this trip, and as he sees all his brothers, maybe some of them are weeping as they walk past this spot, or were hurting, or not talking to him, and he's, he's just kind of soaking it all in, kind of wondering, what is going on? Were they filled with guilt? What about you? Are there certain things that kick back memories of things you haven't truly repented for in your life? Are there things that bring guilt and shame in your heart, in your mind, when you think about the terrible mistakes that you've made in your life or a terrible mistake. Maybe it's somebody that you see when you're walking through town or someone someone you see uh, at Walmart or, or maybe it's a road you drive by through your community or maybe it's a house that you pass where you made a terrible mistake at at some point in your life. Do you have those feelings of guilt that kick back in your memories. You remember that mistake, that one thing that you just can't seem to forgive yourself or forgive someone else for doing. I think it's quite ironic that God, not ironic, I know he did it on purpose, but that I'm back in Vandalia, the place where I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made in my life. How, oh my word, I mean the countless mistakes that I made, and as I, as I say that, the, the people that you walk past, or the, the roads, or the houses, I mean, just driving through town, I can pick out every place I go, I can pick out some place where I made a mistake, where guilt and shame comes over my mind of like, man, wish I wasn't stupid and did that. Wish I would have been smarter. Wish I would have lived for Christ at that moment. Wish I would have been better than that. And, and, and I, love, I, I don't know if you guys saw the, the newspaper um, and that article that they, that they did uh, about me and my son Sam, which I don't know who he is, but somewhere I have a son named Sam. But um, it, it said second chances. It, it said something about a second chance. And that was the one thing that I wanted to make sure as the, artic, as the newspaper was doing that interview with me was that I look at this as an opportunity for a second chance. That the reason why I'm, God has given me this opportunity is because I have an opportunity to um, not make do 
for the things that I did wrong, but I have an opportunity to reach the community that I should have been reaching as a young kid, that I should have been living for Christ and be an example for Christ as a young kid, as a teenager, that's my second chance. Not that I'm trying to make, do a lot of good work to get rid of the guilt that I have in my heart. No, I, I feel the most guilt that I didn't minister to people in junior high and high school when I had an opportunity. That's, that's, where my, that's where my greatest guilt and shame comes from, and I'm getting that second chance to do that. But what about you? What's the one spot in the road of your life that brings back shameful memories for you? As much as you try to forget it and receive God's grace, you feel unworthy and just can't forgive yourself. Or you can't forgive someone else that has wronged you. It was too great of a mistake for that person to receive forgiveness. Or it's too great of a mistake that you made that you can't receive true forgiveness. You hear sermons about God, how God forgives you, and for the most part, you believe that. Small little sins, yes, God can forgive me for, you know, saying a bad word or, or, or lying or doing something like that. But God, just, there's just no way that he can forgive me for doing this. No way. I have just done too many, I, I, it's, just, it's unforgivable what I have done. I'm drawn again to wonder what the brothers felt when they passed that spot where they sold their little brother Joseph into slavery, where they threw him into a well and left him, where they hated him, despised him, were jealous of him, that spot when they wanted him dead. Time has passed now since that hateful day in their lives, but what were their feelings that day they were heading to Egypt about that issue. Years later, did they regret it? Now that they have children of their own, when, how did they handle issues with their own kids whenever their kids had jealous moments and, and spats with one another? Did they say, oh, oh no, 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 little, little Reuben, don't, don't ever treat your brother like that. Don't ever be angry or jealous of your brother. He's going to be your friend one day and then immediately feel an insane amount of guilt in their heart for the way they treated their brother. What was their feelings that they had? I tell my kids all the time to treat each other right, and I can't tell you how many times I've used uh, Aunt Mary as an illustration of how the guilt and regret that I feel in my life for the years of being siblings, normal siblings, and fighting with my, fighting with my sister and being mean to each other and saying we hate each other, which again... Normal sibling stuff, but I tell my kids all the time that they can be taken away at any moment and you'll feel feel the most insane amount of regret in your life for how you've left it, how you left it. I know that's deep for little kids, but I want them to understand that they need to love one another, and I'm sure that's the same amount of regret that the brothers are feeling right now for what they did to their brother. We soon will learn that they were overcome by guilt in their response to Joseph, even before he uncovers the truth. So in verse 16 through 18, it says this, When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, These men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace. Then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. Let me remind you, terrible fam- or famine, terrible drought, famine, terrible times. And Joseph is bringing in these Hebrews, who, again, are looked at as foreigners are like dogs. They're not allowed in the palace. They're not allowed to be uh, wined and dined. When everyone else is outside starving, the whole world is starving, he's whining and dining them. So I just want to make sure I caught that for you guys. Take them inside of the palace, then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's palace. The brothers were terrified when they saw that they were being taken into Joseph's house. It's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time we were here, they said. He plans to pretend that we stole it. Then he will seize us, make us slaves, and take our donkeys. Oh, no, don't take my donkey. Friends, this is the most important part of this message for me. When you can't forgive yourself, you can't release the past, and you are unable to believe that God forgives you. Okay, I want to make sure you hear that. When you can't forgive yourself, 
and release the wrong, terrible thing you did. You're unable to fully receive God's grace in your life. Joseph is forgiving his brothers. He is, he's showing them unbelievable grace. And they can't move past it because of the guilt and shame that they have in their lives. They can't move past it. They can't see the blessing that God is giving them because of what they have done, the shame and the guilt that they carry. They don't think they're worthy of it. And they're not. But they're not able to receive it because of the guilt and the shame that they are holding on to. Friends, Jesus is preparing a table of grace before you that says, I love you and you are forgiven. Just like Joseph is doing to his brothers. Don't, don't miss that because you're holding on to what is no longer there. I know what it's like to hold on to the, the sins and, and the things that I've done wrong and the shame of, oh man, I can't believe I did this. I'm so unworthy. I don't deserve to be forgiven. And, and you hold on to that guilt and that shame that Jesus has cut. It's almost like Jesus came with, if you have these sins of, or chains that hold us down that are sins, and Jesus comes and, and cuts them and breaks them, and then we start to grab them again. We grab both of them. We're trying to put them back together because we think we deserve it. We think that we deserve to be chained down. And Jesus is giving us this table. He's, he's dining us at this table, and he tells us in Psalms 103.12 that as far as the east is from the west, so your sins have been departed. As far as the east is from the west. Friends, we live on a circle planet. The east is never ends. The west never ends. It's a circle. Okay? That's how far Jesus is saying your sins are removed. Forever. Because I can go east forever. I can keep going east and never hit the edge. Okay? I can go west and never hit an edge. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how far your sins are removed when you forgive, when you ask Jesus for forgiveness. So why do we go back? Why do we continue to allow the guilt and the shame control our lives and control our minds. You see, Joseph gives us a perfect picture of Jesus. He, go, he does, he does uh, just as what Jesus does for us. He sets a table before us. God, God feeds us. He forgives us. He saves us. He redeems us. He empowers us. He loves us and he gives us a second chance. And that's what he wants to do for each one of us. He sets a table for us to experience all this. But the brothers still can't quite grasp it. They think they are about to be punished. And again, like as I said, they deserve to be punished. But it's because they just can't release in their mind what is happening. They, they can't experience it because they're holding on to what they've done. Verse, 20, uh, verse 29, it says, Then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother. This is your youngest brother, the one you told me about, Joseph asked. May God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried from the room because he was so overcome with emotion for his brother. He went into the private room where he broke down and he wept. After washing his face because all the Egyptian makeup washed down off of his, on his face. After washing his face, he came back out, keeping himself under control. Then he ordered, bring out the food. Do you feel the emotion, the power from that moment in Joseph's life? Joseph was so overwhelmed about what God was orchestrating in his life. He simply couldn't take it anymore, and he wept bitterly for what God was doing. He wasn't weeping because he was mad at his brothers. He wasn't weeping because of, the, uh, of anything other than the fact that God was orchestrating this amazing moment for him in his life. And only God could do this. Remember what his sons, last week I told you what his sons' names were and, and what they meant. That it was the, the first son, every time he saw the first son, it was that, oh, God has helped me forget my family and forget the terrible thing they did for me. And then the other son was, God had blessed me in my time of burden, my time, terrible time of being deserted and in a different land. And, so, and he was satisfied with that. Joseph was happy and he was satisfied that God helped him to forget his family and what they did to him. The terrible past. He was okay with never seeing them again. But that's not who God is. That's not the God that we serve. 
God is a God that wants to go one step further in our life and He wants to restore us. He wants to restore us. He doesn't want us to be okay with just being okay and like, oh, I can live with this. No, He wants a complete restoration in all things. That's why God brought me to Vandalia. I'm confident that's why God brought me to Vandalia because He wants my life to have complete restoration. He wants me no longer to be held down by my guilt and my shame and the mistakes I made. He's like, all right, Zach, I have great plans for your life and it's going to take you going there. Let's, let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. And I'm going to use this as a, as, a, as a fuel for you to be even greater and to do even more. And God one did this for Joseph. He said, Joseph, I'm not going to just let you be okay with that forgiveness, in, uh, that forgiveness in your heart, but I want you to experience the restoration. I want you to have a, the love of your family. I want you to experience that family that's been torn from you, been ripped in your life. I want to restore you completely. And so he's giving them this amazing moment. My friends, if you've never experienced forgiveness on display like it was in this story, it's like looking at your first newborn baby. Just uh, overwhelming. It's like when someone comes to know Christ that you thought will never come to know Christ. It's like seeing a miraculous miracle. Like if you, you know, I, I've been watching, I watched the Chosen series and seeing those miracles, I know it's all made up, like it's all fake, but knowing that it happened in God's word and just kind of picturing it in your mind, it's so overwhelming and the motion comes over just so strongly when I see that stuff. That's, that's what it's like to see forgiveness like this on display. Forgiveness is, is one of the strongest forces in all of the world. It's what the kingdom of God is built on. That's why Jesus says, if you do not forgive others who have wronged you, you will not receive my forgiveness. That comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. I want to make sure you guys heard that. If you don't forgive those who have wronged you, truly forgive them. And we see the perfect illustration of what forgiveness looks like in what Joseph did here by inviting them into the house by inviting them to have dinner, to wine and to dine with them, to, 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 to bury the hatch and all this stuff, to forgive them. That's the forgiveness that we need to have. Whether they accept it or not, that's the forgiveness that we need to have. Not that, oh, I forgive them, but I never want to talk to them again. Oh, I forgive them, but I never want to have a relationship with them. I don't want them to hurt me again. That's not forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is being able to say, I'm, I forgive you, and we can have a relationship again. Now, they may not want a relationship with you, that's their problem. But you have to still, I want to have this relationship with you because that's what real forgiveness is. Real forgiveness is, is moving past the hurt, moving past the pain, which, which is what he does, does and what Jesus commands each one of us to have. I mean, that's, that's insane that if I don't forgive others who have wronged me, that Jesus won't forgive me. And guys, oh, I don't know if you're like me, I need a lot of forgiveness. And I'm, I'm going through this life praying that Jesus has, forgi has forgiven me. And so, man, I, I need to start forgiving people that have wronged me, and, and, and you do as well. Verse 34, when portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else. So they feasted and drank freely with him. From passing that place of shame on their way to, from, to Egypt, from Canaan, when, the, when sin and hatred reigned in their hearts. They are back together again. These brothers are back together again, feasting and drinking freely with one another and with Joseph. Freely. That word jumped out to me. Are you living freely with Christ? Or are you still bound by your guilt and your shame that you feel from something you did in your past? Or maybe it's your whole past. Because Jesus sets a table for you and wants you to experience his grace freely. And when you are living with guilt and shame, you can't experience the full measure of his grace. Or if you have unforgiveness in your heart, if you can't forgive someone else in your life because of what they did to you, you can't receive the full measure of the forgiveness that Jesus has for you. Guys, I know that some of you have been wronged terribly. Terribly. But you have wronged God terribly. And if he forgives you, you as his child have to forgive everybody. 
no matter what they've done to you. You have to. It's a command. It's a command. There's, it's not negotiable. When you get to heaven, it's not like, oh, God, he, they did something really bad to me. They did something really bad to me. God's like, oh, did you forgive them? Well, I mean, I kind of did. No. Did you forgive them? It's a yes or no answer. And the answer has to be yes. And I don't want to know what the, I don't know what the consequence is. Whether you give your heart to the Lord or not. I don't know what the consequence is because Jesus is very plain here. Very stated. I mean, it's, it's a matter of fact. that I will not forgive you if you don't forgive others. That's a gut punch. Are your chains off in your life? And are you freely experiencing God's grace this morning? I love how Joseph is able to forgive his brothers. Why? Why was Joseph able to forgive his brothers? Because God had taught him through the 13 years in slavery and in prison, God had taught him that the world will fail you, Joseph. The world will fail you, and your family will fail you. But I, your God, will never, ever fail you. It may take a while for me to fulfill my plans for your life, because I want to make sure you're ready for it. But I will never fail you. So there's no reason that Joseph needed to hold on to the, to the shame, need to hold on to the, the revenge or the, the anger and the frustration that he was free to forgive his brothers because he knew that his God had never wronged him and his God was going to work all things together for his good. Nate and Jessica, will you go ahead and come move forward? I'm going to end just with this I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read this, the book, that uh, Everybody Always by Bob Goff, but there's a story in there that uh, I'm going to spoil for you guys. And, and I challenge you, if you haven't ordered it, I put it on our Facebook page. If you haven't ordered it, it's a really easy book, and you can listen to it on Audible. It's not very, or any sort of online book, and it's really easy, uh, easy book. One of the easiest books that I've ever listened or read to. And... Um, I encourage you, it, it's powerful, but there's one scene in it uh, where he talks about, he has this mission, uh, he does this mission stuff in Uganda, Africa, and he, he's a lawyer, and he goes to Uganda, Africa, because he wants to go against witch doctors. No one ever goes against witch doctors because they're, um, they usually have people killed for doing that, and everyone's scared of witch doctors because they're going to curse me or, or, or put a curse on my family, and Bob is a strong Christian, he's like, I'm not scared of that, I'm not scared of witch doctors. And so he goes to Uganda and does this ministry. And what they do is these witch doctors will steal children and will castrate them and kill them, murder them, because they want to use their blood for, like, sacrifices, their purity and their blood. And, the, and so they kill kids. And Bob is just, like, enraged by that, that no one is doing anything. So he has this thing. Well, anyway, he meets this boy, uh, meets this boy, and I don't want to spoil too much, but he meets this boy, and they... They, they go against the very first um, witch doctor ever go on trial in, in Uganda, Africa. And his name is Kabi. And he's found guilty and he goes to prison forever. And uh, God stirs in Bob's heart that he needs to go see this witch doctor in prison. And so he goes to see this witch doctor in prison. And one of the most miraculous things happen. That Kabi comes to know Jesus comes to know Jesus. And Bob looks at Kabi as his enemy, an unforgivable thing of what he did to so many different children. Looks at him as his enemy, and this enemy has now become his brother. And he has to wrestle with that of like, oh, how do I, I, I hate this guy. What he did to this, this kid, and what he did, and by the way, this kid he adopts. The kid that, it's a weird situation, but he adopts this kid, so it's now his son. And so he has this struggle with him, and, uh, and through this interaction and relationship, um, Kabi comes to know Christ. Kabi leads hundreds of men, witch doctors, to Christ in this prison, and, and, and terrible people to Christ. And one of the most amazing lines in there is Kabi comes to um, Bob and says, Bob, I forgive you. Bob's like, you forgive me? I didn't do anything wrong. You're the bad person. And he says, and he goes, why do you forgive me? And Kabi tells him, it's because I, you're my enemy. And God's word says that we are to have, seek forgiveness for all enemies. 
And so he repents and seeks forgiveness in his enemy. And this restoration happens because he allowed forgiveness to take roots and allowed forgiveness to take root in his heart. And and, um, God does something amazing from this terrible situation. And God does something amazing because he allows forgiveness to have a hold of his life. He allows forgiveness to, to rule the day. And today, this morning, I challenge you that allow forgiveness to win the day. I don't know if you have guilt or shame in your heart this morning. Seek forgiveness. Re- repent. And never go back to again. Don't grab those chains anymore. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, stop going back to it. Stop feeling guilt or shame. Jesus is forgiven. Maybe people might know, remember it, but it doesn't matter. They're not the ones judging you. God is the one that judges. And if God doesn't remember it, stop dwelling on it. Stop dwelling on it. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, if someone has wronged you, find forgiveness. Find forgiveness. Because God wants to do something remarkable in each one of our lives. He wants to do something remarkable in this church. All of us are going to have a part in this, whatever God's going to do through this body of believers. Every single one of us are going to have a part in that. We're all going to be pastors and ministers as we reach this community. And it has to happen when forgiveness is taken root. When we've experienced the grace of God in our lives, then we can be that perfect reflection of what Jesus wants to do in other people's lives. But if we hold that bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts, then we can't truly experience the grace. And so people can't truly know the grace of God through our lives and through our love if we have not experienced it ourselves. Friends, find the person that you need to ask forgiveness who needs who needs you need to forgive and make restoration occur allow God to restore you and do something incredible in your life and in your family and in our church and in our community I I just can't wait what God's going to do through each one of us